Partial differential equations. They're everywhere. Just about any law that you can think of in physics is governed by a PDE. So it's important we understand them. Let's look at a simple PDE first, the linear convection equation. This PDE says, if I have a wave u, as time goes by, this wave is going to move in the direction x with speed a. And if I run a simulation, for example, let's start off with a Gaussian initial wave, what I'm going to see is that the wave is going to move in the direction x with constant speed a. And if I let it run, that's exactly what I get. I'm just putting on periodic boundary conditions so that as soon as it comes out one side, it shoots over to the other side. That's not very interesting though, so let's make it a little bit more spicy. What I've done now is I've switched the constant speed a for u. So if I look at this equation now, what it says is if I have a wave u, as time goes by, it's going to move in the direction x according to the speed of whatever height the wave is at that point. It's a bit weird. This equation is called Berger's equation. And the reason it's weird is because it's now a nonlinear equation. In fact, it's a prototype for what nonlinear equations usually are. It's nonlinear because instead of the whole wave moving with a constant speed a, different parts of the same wave move with different speeds. The wave actually moves according to whatever the height of the wave is at that point. And if we let this simulation run, we find something very strange. The top part of the wave overtakes the bottom part of the wave since it's moving faster, but around 0.2 seconds, we run into a very difficult problem. You'll notice that the top part of the wave has overtaken the bottom part of the wave so much so that the wave is now vertical. And we all know from our elementary calculus class that you can't take a derivative of a vertical function. So our PDE doesn't really seem to make sense anymore since we're taking a derivative of u. Okay, you might say, why don't we just let it keep running? I mean, the top part's gonna keep overtaking the bottom part and then it'll be a smooth wave. Well, we run into an even bigger problem in that case because then the function is gonna be multi-valued. It won't even pass the vertical line test. And so it won't even be a function at all. So does this mean that Berger's equation doesn't have a solution past 0.2 seconds? Not quite. But if we're gonna find the solution, we're gonna to have to accept that it's not gonna be a function. This idea of a breaking wave dates all the way back to 1848, when British astronomer James Challis noticed something very strange about the solutions to the 1D Euler equations. The Euler equations are a simplified model for how a fluid like air or water might flow. And Poisson had put forth a set of solutions 40 years earlier but Chalice noticed that using a certain set of initial conditions, then after a finite amount of time, these solutions became multi-valued, which doesn't make sense if we're talking about functions. So that's when George Stokes, another famous physicist, came forth with a radical theory. He said, why not let these pressure waves be discontinuous, have an abrupt change in pressure and velocity as you move across the wave? He actually gave a very precise mathematical description for what these discontinuous waves might look like, and he didn't know it at the time, but this would be a huge advancement in the field of fluid mechanics. Of course, like a lot of important theories in the history of science, his theory was not met well at first. Two very big names in the field, Lord Kelvin and Lord Rayleigh, I'm sure you've heard of them, they thought this idea was ridiculous. Their biggest complaint seemed to be with the idea that these pressure waves, these discontinuous waves wouldn't satisfy conservation of energy. And you know, that makes sense. To them, conservation of energy was everything. They didn't know about thermodynamics at the time. And unfortunately, Stokes was convinced. He actually backed down, he issued a public apology, and he even retracted his original publication. It wouldn't be until decades later, after a lot of hard work by many physicists and mathematicians, that Stokes' idea would be vindicated. Of course, today we understand these discontinuities very well. We call them shocks. Every time you pop a balloon, you hear an explosion, a sonic boom. These are all examples of a discontinuous pressure wave. All that Stokes was missing 
was a little bit of mathematical theory. So let's do that. This is the strong form of Berger's equation. For the sake of the next steps, it's actually more useful to write it in what's called the conservative form, where we just use the product rule on the derivative term. So we have a problem, because u can be discontinuous, but we can't take a derivative of a discontinuous function. So we do something instead. We multiply the entire equation by what's called a test function. A test function is just an arbitrary function that we can differentiate, and that is zero at the boundaries. We start by multiplying the conservative form of the PDE by the test function. Then, we integrate both sides in both space and time. The reason we do this is so that we can use integration by parts to transfer the derivative from u to the test function. And because the test function is zero at the boundaries, we can get rid of those boundary terms, and we're left with what we call the weak form of the PDE. It looks a bit weird, but you'll notice that all the derivatives that normally act on u have been transferred to the test function, which is differentiable. So we're no longer breaking any rules here with a discontinuous solution. So here we have the strong form and the weak form side by side. In the strong form, the solution u has to be differentiable, but in the weak form, u only has to be integrable. If a solution satisfies the strong equation, it also satisfies the weak equation. However, if a solution satisfies the weak equation, it does not necessarily satisfy the strong equation. Therefore, the weak equation allows for more general kinds of solutions. These more general solutions don't even have to be functions. We call these more general solutions distributions. Now that's really just a fancy word for something that can only be defined if you integrate it alongside a test function. So side note, remember that delta function from physics class that seems to pop up everywhere? It's actually also a distribution, because it only makes sense when you integrate it alongside another function. So moving away from the strong form of the PDE, and by using the weak form instead, we allow for more general solutions, just like shock waves for the Euler equations of gas flow. And that's not even the end. We can keep loosening the restrictions on our PDE and get more and more general solutions. But maybe we'll leave that for a later video. Okay, now that we have the math out of the way, let's go back to Berger's equation. But this time, we'll solve for the weak form of the equation. You notice that the solution is actually well defined past 0.2 seconds. It's just a traveling discontinuity, just like a shock. And eventually, slowly, it'll die out. Just like a wave in real life. So a question that some people might have is, is the weak form of a PDE actually correct? I mean, it just seems so arbitrary. And my answer to that is, why not? I mean, what makes the weak form of a PDE any more arbitrary than the strong form? They're both arbitrary. And it would be insane to assume that any mathematical theory we have today is 100% correct. I mean, that's the whole process of science. You start off with a theory, you find a problem with that theory, and then you find a better theory to replace it. As a scientist, you have to be open to the possibility of being wrong. You can't just cling on to old theories just because you like them. And anyway, weird things happen all the time in physics. Open any textbook on quantum mechanics or cosmology and you'll find the same thing. We shouldn't be surprised to find weird things happening in mathematics and fluid mechanics as well. So if you like this video, give Beyond the Big Bang a like and subscribe. I glossed over a lot of details in this video because I didn't want it to be half an hour long, but in the future I might, for example, talk about how to actually solve the weak form of a PDE, whether it be analytically or numerically. I also really should mention that I didn't cover thermodynamics at all in this video, and thermodynamics just completely solves that problem raised by Rayleigh and Kelvin. I'll cover that all in later videos, but for now, if there's anything you guys want us to cover, leave it in the comments down below, and if this video gets 100,000 likes, I will shave off my eyebrows and dye my hair pink. Until then, I'll see you guys in the next video with some more fun physics. See ya!